Hey, that's a compliment, Katie. That was beautiful. And you know what? It made a proclamation that one day every every man, woman, and child will make. That's Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, I'm so glad to be in God's house this morning. I'm so glad to be with his people this morning. And I'm so glad to be in God's word specifically where we're at today. And that's in the book of Titus. So if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, please make your way to the book of Titus. Uh, it's right before the book of Hebrews. Um, it's after Genesis. It's before maps. But we're going to be in Titus chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 14 today. So once you find your place in Chi and, uh, Titus chapter 2, uh, please turn with me to uh, verse 11. Stand if your body is able and you are willing uh, for the honor of reading God's holy word. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that I would become a barren vessel, a mouthpiece. Father, speak boldly. Speak directly to our heart. Speak to the sin in our life. Speak, God, to the areas of encouragement that we need encouragement. Father, speak to the pain and the confusion that's in our minds. Speak, God, to the areas that haven't been spoken to in a long time, Father. Speak. We trust in you, God, and we trust in your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So uh, the Taylor family decided to start a revolutionary movement uh, concerning the lighting of lights around Christmas time. What we've decided to do, most people traditionally put the lights on the outside. We don't. We put the lights on the inside. So if you want to see a lit up house, come to the Taylor house. It's lit up right now. I feel like Chevy Chase in a Christ that Christmas movie. We walk in and we don't need no lights because the Christmas lights are everywhere. But as we were going through the process, I had my daughters and my wife was getting stuff set up. We had garland. We had, you guys know them stuff, little pieces of just everything, everywhere. We're Christmas, Christmasizing our house. And, 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 and it's so amazing how we need these visual uh, these visual things to get us in the mood. We need to see holly and fern in order for us to know it's Christmas. And so, you know, we, we're getting all this stuff out. We've got this one long-legged reindeer that looks like he needs to go to the doctor. We've got all kinds of, you know, we've got all kinds of stuff we're putting out. Um, but my favorite thing in our whole house, and we've got a hodgepodge. Our favorite thing is Cody's got this uh, nativity scene. That's, that's, that's what she collects. She collects nativity scenes. And she has this nativity scene, it's, and, and I think it's porcelain or glass, but it's, but it's all one piece, and, you know, it has each member of the nativity scene cut out, and, 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 and it's hollow, and it has a little light inside of it, you know, and it plugs in the wall. And then you turn it on, and, and it's like lighting, like the fire inside um, the manger maybe would, would be what it looked like. You know, light was coming out of this glass piece. And it's setting on an end table. Um, check this out, church, that uh, my father bought when we were stationed in Turkey in Ankara when I was uh, three and a half years old. 
Um, I think it's pretty neat that God's allowed us to go back to Turkey. Anyways, there's all kinds of stuff going on in my head right now. This porcelain thing setting on this end table, but right behind the manger is this giant cross. And, and it's two completely different seasonal decorations, right? The cross is out year-round, but this manger is a new addition to the aesthetic experience at the Taylor House. So, But what's interesting is how this manger is completely shadowed by this cross. And, it, and, it, and at first, you know, it struck me as beautiful, but the more and more I looked at it, 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 it began to really make me prepare my heart for really what's happening right now. Really what we're celebrating right now is we're celebrating an epiphany in the mankind of God's grace through the form of his son, Jesus Christ through a virgin birth and a crazy birth of that. And we see that represented in the nativity scene. But what I'm realizing as I grow in my faith, that this time of the year points to the cross. Because if he would have came and been born, but had not died, we would have not salvation. If he had not died and had not rose again, we would have not victory over death. But it's because of his incarnation, his birth, his ministry, his miracles, his life, his teaching, his death, and his resurrection do we have hope and salvation. So praise God for the cradle, but praise God for the cross, and praise God even greater for the empty tomb. Amen. And that's, that's this, that's this, isn't it funny how little household things can spawn thoughts in your mind? I'm looking at this. And then of course we have a half eaten puddle of whatever right next to it. But anyways, I say all that to say, guys, we're entering into Christmas time. We just came out of Thanksgiving. Some of y'all still got the grease on your face, but we're coming into Christmas and y'all let's take a word of encouragement. Let's rest this season as a church. Let's rest in the grace of God this Christmas season. Today, we're going to talk about the workings of grace. And I want this word to be a word of encouragement for you. I want this word to be a salve to your spirit right now. I want this word to be rest for your bones. Guys, if you're like me, um, grace sometimes is something, it's a commodity we use in our Christian jargon often. But in that, sometimes we can lose the mystique of grace, right? Just like anything else, if it becomes familiar, it can become less uh, mysterious, less beautiful, less awestruck. You know, it's the fact that I don't live in the Grand Canyon that allows the image of the Grand Canyon to be the Grand Canyon when I view it for the first time. It's the fact that when I, you, now you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the time when you met God's grace, not the time when you could have explained it theologically, but the time when you met God's grace, you cried out to him and he saved you and God's grace appeared to you. That moment, that feeling, Feeling of rest. That's what the season's about. Let us rest in His grace. Oh, the feeling, knowing that I'm not responsible for the wage of my sin anymore. The feeling and knowing that my Savior has saved me. Now, guys, we're going to dig into this word very fast and very quick. We got. 27 minutes before y'all start keeping count, so we're going to get into it. Titus is the letter we're studying currently on Wednesday nights. If you come to our Wednesday night uh, class, you realize we're going verse by verse through this letter. Now, it's not a very long letter. If you're unfamiliar with Titus, it's merely three chapters long, and it's, and it's very interesting because it's a part of what we call the pastoral epistles, the pastoral letters. Now, who else would have uh, been a pastor besides Titus? And we know the answer probably to be Timothy, right? 
So you have 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. These are letters that were written to pastors. But as I'm reading Titus, and as we're going through it on Wednesdays, I'm realizing that this was written to Titus for the church. You hear me? To Titus for the church. And so this is going to be a letter that was written to Titus 2,000 years ago from my heart today. Because God's word's alive and living. Let's read it again. Ch uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God. This phrase is very interesting. The word for is a preposition in the Greek language. It's the word gar. Everybody say gar. I heard a preacher say that's what a Greek pirate would sound like. Gar. It's a, it's a very strong preposition. It's one of the strongest emphatic ways you can bring about the statement that he's bringing right now. He says, listen, chapter 1, Titus, dear Titus, I love you. You're my son, and I've left you there on this island of Crete, and you've got to do some work. You've got to do some work, Titus, because when I left the island of Crete, I left some work unfinished. Now, Titus, we've got churches all over the place, but what we don't have is we don't have godly leadership. So, Titus, what I want you to do is I want you to find some godly men who fit a criteria that's based on biblical standards. And chapter 1 is spent giving you a description of godly leadership. This is what godly leadership should look like, X, Y, Z. But then he breaks into chapter 2 and he says, but you, Titus, you've got to teach what sounds with what accords with sound doctrine. He says, not only do you need godly leadership in a church, but you need sound biblical preaching. Titus, don't forget, teach what's true. And then he breaks out in chapter 2, explaining some more uh, roles inside the church. If you've been a part of our class, you realize that we've talked about how chapter 2 is almost this natural picture of discipleship in a church. Do you realize that you may not be a part of a discipleship group? And I understand that. But do you realize that discipleship is happening in our church naturally? Because the church is a living organism, and God has built this organism in such a way that the older men come alongside the younger men, and they show them how to live. And the older women should come alongside the younger women and show them how to live. But you know what happens a lot of time is the older men say, well, these younger men, they don't have no time for that, or they don't come from the same generation that I come from. And the younger men say, well, those older men don't know what it's like to be a father in these days, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And then you got the older women saying, well, those younger women don't want no time with us. And you got the younger women saying, well, those old ladies, I don't want to. And you got this complete breakdown of discipleship. And what Paul says is, Titus, son, in order for the bride to be the bride, you're going to have to have some natural discipleship take place in your church. You're going to have to have these older men, these leaders, come alongside the younger men. And these older women come alongside the younger women. And you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have these bond servants come alongside their masters and serve in a godly way. And then he gets down to verse 11. He says, for God, because of the grace of God. Because the grace of God. Titus, I need you to build leadership, not so that you can have the best church in town, but because the grace of God has appeared. God, Titus, I need you to make sure that these men who are leaders in your church are biblical leaders, not for appearance, but for the grace of God. Titus, I need you to make sure that discipleship is happening inside of your church, not so that you can be the best pastor in town, but for the grace of God has appeared. Titus. The grace of God is the motivation of everything you're going to do on the island of Crete. And it'll be what defines your ministry. And it'll be what sustains your ministry. And so what this passage does and what I'm going to present to you, and I don't have an outline. This is the outline right here. Scripture is. The outline simply is this. Grace works in the past, in the present, and in the future. Titus gives us, Paul gives us the inner workings of grace, and he says grace works to save, grace works to sanctify, and grace works to give us a living hope. 
Grace works in the past to save. Grace works in the present to sanctify. And grace works in the future to give us a living hope. And he shows us this right in the text. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared. Now that word appear is pretty interesting in the Greek language. It's the same word we get for epiphany. You ever had an epiphany? I have. You know what I'm talking about? The kind of epiphany where you're like, okay, these jeans aren't going to fit. <laughs> kind of epiphany where you're like, that's what my dad meant when he said that. The kind of epiphany where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm lost. The kind of epiphany that's like all of a sudden, nothing and then something comes. The word in the Greek literally means to appear. It means to appear suddenly. It means to show or to show upon, to bring to light, to appear, to make visible, to become, to make clearly known, to show oneself. And Paul says, God's grace has appeared as if it was an epiphany of mankind. It broke through time and space and entered into the mankind's experience. God's grace has appeared. But we know that God's grace is not a person, right? It's a concept. God's grace. Paul says God's grace. He takes the concept of what grace is, and he says that thing, God's grace, has appeared. Well, what is that? Well, in the Greek, grace is charis. It means gift. It means unmerited favor. It means God's favor. My favorite definition of grace is this. It speaks of the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps them, strengthens them, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, and affection, and kindles them to the exercise of the Christian virtues. God's grace has appeared. Grace has appeared for what? It says, verse 11, grace has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Understand this, child of God. God's grace has worked for you by saving you. You want to know how grace works? Grace works to save. Grace works to take people like me and make them right with God. God's grace works to save. Well, the big question in theological circles right now is who? Who has God's grace worked to save? Paul emphatically says, everyone. Paul says, God's grace has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, to every person. Well, I know that, but you know, there is a big difference between us and our family and then that family over there and what they do. And there's a big difference between what goes on here and what goes on over there. And there's a big difference between, you know, what I do and what they do. And what, what Paul is saying is, Titus, listen, the key to understanding the inner workings of grace is that it has appeared to mankind, number one. First of all, the fact has, that God made his grace known to man is a beautiful thing. But but then not only has it appeared, but it appeared and it brought with it salvation for all men, for every person. For the person who had the child outside of wedlock, for the person who came from across the tracks, for the person who doesn't match up with your racial criteria of what a good person is, for that person. And specifically in context, who is, who is Paul really talking about? Well, go with me to chapter 1. Go with me to chapter 1. Look at verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. And then check this out, verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said this. Cretans are always liars evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Guess who God's grace appeared? It appeared to that guy. 
to that lazy, evil, glutton, slanderer, vile. He, Paul said to Titus, don't you forget, I know it's hard there in Crete. I know the people around you in Crete are always the honest ones. I know that they cheat, and I know that they're liars, and I know that they're dogs, but understand God's grace has appeared to them, just as it has to you. Don't forget that, Titus. It's going to be key to your evangelism. It's going to be key to your church ministry is the understanding that God's grace has appeared to all men. Goes on to say, verse 12 of chapter 2, verse 11, for, God's, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Not only has God's grace worked in the past to save, but God's grace is working in the present to sanctify you, to change you, to mold you, to train you, Brother Bill's a coach at the high school, and he knows what it's like to take a child and train a child. And I promise you, the kids he's training in fourth and fifth grade look a lot different than the kids he's training, hopefully, in 11th and 12th grade. Amen? And when they don't, they run laps. But the bottom line is this life we live is a progressive one. Praise God you're not the same way you were six years ago. Praise God you're not the same way you were 10 years ago. Praise God you're not the same way you were two hours ago, hopefully, coming out of a small group. Child, son, daughter of God, understand this. This life we live is a life of progression. God takes us, and then through his spirit, by his grace, he changes us. And he does that in two ways. First, he does that by teaching us to deny ungodliness. And then he tells us there, he says there in verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. I love, I love the way Paul teaches. He, he, does, he does a positive negative. He does that a lot of times in his writings. You'll notice he'll, he'll do one of those build, break, build models of education. He says, listen, God's grace does something. First, it does something in the negative. It teaches us not to live ungodly. But then it does something in the positive. It teaches us to live righteously. Isn't God good that he doesn't just say, this is your sin, but rather he says, this is your sin, and this is how you fix your sin? Isn't God good to do that? Boy, the church should look more like that, shouldn't we? Sometimes we're just really good at pointing out sin without giving a solution. But God's word gives both the acknowledgement of sin and the acknowledgement of sufficiency of Christ. God's grace works to save. God's grace works to sanctify. You know what I love about that word training? That word training there is an interesting word, or your, your translation may say instructing. In the original language, it's, it's something that a parent would say concerning their child. Training, instructing, it, it, it's to train a child, it's to be instructed or taught or to learn. It speaks of to cause one to learn. You ever cause your child to learn? Boy, I have. I'm about to cause you, girl, if you don't sit down. <laughs> I'm going to cause you to learn real quick. God's grace causes us to learn. God's grace instructs us. <laughs> It speaks of to chastise, to chastise or to castigate with words, to correct. It speaks of those who are molding the character of others by reproof and admonition. Reproof and admonition. Reproof and admonition. This is the daily walk for the Christian who's in the Word of God. Reproof and admonition. Here's your sin. Here's how you fix it. Here's what's broken. Let me put it back together again. Reproof and admonition. Teaching us to deny ungodliness. God's grace works to save. God's grace works to sanctify. And lastly, God's grace works to give a living hope. Verse 12 says, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. 
Guys, there's so much we're skipping over. We could talk about this passage has my heart in a way I haven't had a scripture had me in a long time. This is so rich. But it says to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. That's a three-point sermon right there. Self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. When? In this present age. I'm so sick in hearing about weak-spirited Christians saying it's so hard to live godly in this age. Yes, it is, but God's grace is sufficient. He has made a way for you to live godly in this present age. He has made a way for you, for a man to be a man when now men don't know who they are. He's made a way for a woman to be a woman when she don't know who she is. He's made a way for us to live godly today. Today. Sometimes that's the hardest thing for me to grab a hold of. Today. God's grace works to sanctify. And then lastly, Verse 13, waiting for a blessed or blessed hope. And then he describes it. He defines that hope. That hope is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what? I've got friends right now who are struggling with the concept of how Jesus can be God. Let me tell you something. This is one of the most theologically plain texts in all of Scripture that says Jesus Christ is God. He says right here, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people, for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Next week, we're going to talk about verse 14. But let me tell you this. If you're a child of the king, meaning if you have come to an awareness that there's something wrong with you, and you've come to the awareness that that thing that is wrong with you is called sin. And whether you can know what sin is or not doesn't really matter. But again, it's the fact that you know that something separates you from a pure and holy God. And that thing has been now paid for by the appearance of God's grace. God's grace has brought you salvation. But it didn't just stop there. No, God's grace is now training you. It's correcting you. It's molding you. It's reproving you. It's, ad, it's admonishing you. But it doesn't just stop today. This is, this is where God's word becomes sweet. You ready? God's grace gives us hope for tomorrow. Hang in there, child of God. I know life is tough. I know it is. I see lots of lives through the week. I hear lots of story of death, pain, suffering, and sickness. But rest assured, if you are in Christ Jesus, you have a living hope that death, pain, or sickness cannot touch. You have a living hope that the legal system cannot touch. You have a legal hope that are legal, a living hope that your money cannot touch or lack of it. It's living because Christ is living. It's hopeful because he will appear. This is, this is expectational waiting. This is knowing. This is when you sit at home saying, my daddy better come pick me up from school. He is going to come back. My king will return. I know he will. I'm not going to sit here and wait and, and, and count the blood moons. I'm going to sit here and evangelize for God's grace has appeared to all men. And while I do it, I'm going to expect my king to come back. Because my hope is living. You know what that really means? It's life giving. As our invitation team comes forward, every head bowed, every eye closed. There's nine million ways to skin the invitational cat, but I don't know what to do besides this.